Congress or legislative house that they have there in Hong Kong that was going to allow uh, mainland China, the Chai Coms. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Sorry to be uh, late. There was some uh, traffic detours. Um, I'm so glad to be here with my sister Rashid today. Um, today we're here to highlight the... Before I actually start, we were supposed to have a couple of our, the other speakers. Are they in the room? Do you want to join yeah, us? Please come up. How are you? Thank you for coming. Thank you for everything you do. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for speaking up. Well, wonderful. Today we're here to highlight the human cost of the occupation and travel restrictions on Palestinians and others. As many of you know, I had planned to travel to Israel and Palestine to hear from individuals on the ground about the conflict so that I could be more informed as a member of Congress and as a member on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Contrary to many media reports, and the statements of the Israeli Prime Minister. I plan to meet directly with members of the Knesset and Israeli security, along with Palestinian civil society groups, former IDF soldiers, Israel, Palestine, and international organizations, and United Nations officials. Leading up to the trip, I met with constituents holding a wide range of views on the conflict. All the activities on my trip had been done by members had been done by members of Congress in the past, including a nearly identical trip a few years ago led by the very same Palestinian organization leading this trip. In addition to me and Rashida going on the trip, we were going to be joined by Stacy Plasquette from the Virgin Islands. The decision to ban me and my colleagues, the first, my colleague, the first two Muslim American women elected to Congress, is nothing less than an attempt by an ally of the United States to suppress our ability to do our jobs as elected officials. But this is not just about me. Netanyahu's decision to deny us entry might be unprecedented for members of Congress but it is the policy of his government when it comes to Palestinians. This is the policy of his government when it comes to anyone who holds views that threaten the occupation, a policy that has been edged on and supported by Trump's administration. That's because the only way to preserve unjust policy is to suppress people's freedom of uh, expression freedom of association, and freedom of movement. My colleague and I are not the only ones who are being denied the right to see for ourselves the reality on the ground on the West Bank. The Netanyahu government, for example, is currently trying to deport Omar Shakir, a human rights worker with Human Rights Watch, because he has reported on human rights conditions in the West Bank and Gaza. Last year, the Netanyahu government refused entry to American citizen Catherine Frank, Frank and my friend Vince Warren, who had arrived on a human rights mission. All of these actions have nothing to, do nothing to bring us closer to peace. In fact, they do the opposite. They maintain the occupation and prevent a solution to the conflict. Fortunately, we in the United States have a constructive role to play. We give Israel more than $3 million in aid every year. This is predicated on their being an important ally in the region and the only democracy in the Middle East. But denying visit to duly elected members of Congress is not consistent with being an ally and denying millions of people freedom of movement or expression or self-determination is not consistent with being a democracy. We must be asking 
as Israel's ally, the Netanyahu government stop the expansion of settlements on Palestinian land and ensure full rights for Palestinians if we are to give them aid. These are not just my views. These are the views held by the range of experts, peace advocates on this issue. We know Donald Trump would love nothing more than to use this issue to pit Muslims and Jewish Americans against each other. The Muslim community and the Jewish community are being othered and made into the boogeyman by this administration. But, uh, but as we will hear today, people of all different faiths are coming together to speak up against the status quo in the region. I'm grateful for the solidarity shown by so many of my colleagues in Congress. I understand and appreciate the calls for members to avoid traveling to Israel until Rashida and I are allowed to go without condition. But it is my belief that as legislators, we have an obligation to see the reality there for ourselves. We have a responsibility to conduct oversight over our government's foreign policy and what happens with the millions of dollars we send in aid. So I would encourage my colleagues to visit, meet with the people we were going to meet with, see the things we were going to see, hear the stories we were going to hear. We cannot, we cannot let Trump and Netanyahu succeed in hiding the cruel reality of the occupation from us. So I call on all of you to go. The occupation is real, bearing, barring members of Congress from seeing it does not make it go away. We must end it together. Now, it's with honor that I introduce my sister, Rashida Tlaib, who has been so brave and resilient and someone um, who has deep connections to the region uh, and someone who I would have loved to, met, to have met um, her city, Rashida Tlaib. Thank you so much to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for inviting me to her district to join you all today. I am incredibly thankful for her leadership and strength through all uh, she has been dealing with uh, as a woman of color in Congress. I don't know how she does it sometimes, but the outpouring of support we have received from our constituents and supporters across the country shows us how important it is to keep fighting for justice. Today's, today, Reps Omar and Plasquet and I were supposed to be on a congressional trip and delegation to the Palestine and Israel. And such delegations are common occurrence for members of Congress. Earlier this month, in fact, 71 other members of Congress traveled to Israel seemingly without incident. What is not common occurrence is members of Congress being barred from entering a country on these fact-finding missions unless they agree to strict set of rules curtailing their rights or being required to submit their itineraries for stop-by-stop -stop pre-approval. History does have a habit of repeating itself. I learned this week that a former member of Congress, Congressman Charles C. Diggs, Jr., was denied entry into apartheid South Africa in 1972. He was also the representative for the 13th Congressional District in Michigan. I was born and raised in the beautiful Detroit, where many of my African-American teachers taught me about the realities of oppression and justice and the need to speak up and take action. Growing up in a city that has been at the center of many social justice movements for civil rights, labor rights, and equality, and absorbing those lessons has shaped who I am today and drives me to push for peace and justice for the Palestinian and Israeli people. As a young girl visiting Palestine to see my grandparents and extended family, I watched as my mother had to go through dehumanizing checkpoints. Even though she was a United States citizen and proud American, I was there when my city was in a terrible car accident and my cousins and I cried so she could have access to the best hospitals, which were in Jerusalem. 
I remember shaking with fear when checkpoints appeared in the small village of Beit Aur al-Foka, tanks and guns everywhere. I remember visiting East Jerusalem with my then husband and him escorting, escorted off the bus, although he was a United States citizen, just so security forces could harass him. All I can do as my city's granddaughter, as the, as the granddaughter of a woman who lives in occupied territory, is to elevate her voice by exposing the truth the only way I know how. As my Detroit public schools teachers taught me by humanizing the pain of oppression. Our delegation trip included meetings with Israeli veterans who were forced to participate in military occupation. They also desperately want peace and self-determination for their Palestinian neighbors. They could have shed light into injustices of raids, shootings, demolitions, and child detention. The delegation would have seen firsthand why walls are destructive, not productive. They could have asked the people in Bethlehem how walls cut people off away from economic opportunities, from a way to live, and do psychological damage that lasts forever. All I can do as her granddaughter is help humanize her and the Palestinian people's plight. I know that when we can finally see them as deserving of human dignity, everyone who lives there will be able to live in peace. It is unfortunate that Prime Minister Netanyahu has apparently taken a page out of Trump's book and even direction from Trump to deny this opportunity. And yes, while folks are shocked that this happened to us, but today we will hear from folks who will help show the reality for many who have been barred from going to, into Israel not to be even able to reach the Palestinian people. They are fellow Americans who cannot visit their families or their loved ones. They should be deep, all of us should be deeply disturbed. All of us Americans should be deeply disturbed. And with that, I then thank you so much. Uh, to my co uh, colleague, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for helping humanize the Palestinian people. Thank you, Rashida. Um, <clears throat> next, we will hear from uh, Lana Berwaki, Palestinian American and a Minnesota resident who has never been able to return to her family's homeland of Palestine. Thank you, Ilhan. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you to Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib for inviting me to speak today. I was asked to share some of my personal story. I'm Lana Barkawi. I'm um, the daughter of Palestinian immigrants to this country. I live in Minneapolis with my husband and my two children. And although I am Palestinian, I have never been able to visit Palestine. My story is like that of so many people who live in the diaspora caused by the occupation of Palestine by Israel. Palestine is a home I have never seen and one that I long to see. About 25 years ago, I was a college student visiting family in Jordan with my mother, father, and sisters. We were considering taking a side trip to visit the occupied West Bank, a visit that would include seeing for the first time my father's family's village called Burqa, a small town near the city of Nablus, Burqa, it's the word at the heart of my last name, Barqawi. <clears throat> we are the people of Burqa. Incidentally, this is such a common Palestinian thing that no matter how long your family has been living in exile, um, your Palestinian identity is strong. Other Palestinians you meet will want to know, what town is your family from? Are you able to visit? If you can go, you should, it's beautiful. Implicit in these questions is a longing for our people to know our homeland and a hope that we can someday return. Back to that summer 25 years ago, ultimately we did not attempt to visit Palestine. As I mentioned, we were in Amman, Jordan, and we would have, um, we would have tried to cross into West, the West Bank at a bridge crossing that spans the Jordan River. Until uh, under, Israel, in, excuse me, under Israel's laws, the decision to allow or to deny our entry would have been made by a heavily armed Israeli soldier. We would have been at their mercy, making ourselves vulnerable to the occupying state of Israel. Ultimately, we did not attempt to visit. 
and I have to say I was quite disappointed at the time. I was a college student reckoning with my identity, trying to reconcile everything I knew about my loving family and our close-knit community of Palestinian and other Arab friends in the United States. Balance all of that against the menacing images of Palestinians I constantly saw on the news and in Hollywood. I wanted so badly to visit Palestine and see it all for myself. It was my parents' decision not to attempt the visit, not to attempt to enter Israel. My father talked about our safety. He did not want to put me and my two sisters in harm's way. We knew the stories about what happens to Palestinians when they attempt to enter Israel, the indignities and the fear that Israeli soldiers have the power to put them through. Since that summer, I have come to understand that decision of my parents in a deeper way that beyond the truth of their concern for our safety, there was a more fundamental truth. My father could not bring himself to be in a position where an Israeli soldier is a person in control of his entry into his homeland. There is an enduring trauma that he and my mother live. They live in exile from Palestine, from Burqa, and from my mother's family's ancestral home in Yaffa. And to have the decision of our entry in the hands of an Israeli soldier was too great a psychic anguish to bear. This pales, of course, in comparison to the brutal life under occupation that millions of Palestinians face on a daily basis. Representative Omar is my congresswoman, and I am indebted to her and to Representative Tlaib for having the courage to bring the cruel and racist occupation of Palestine by Israel into the national conversation. The dispossession and displacement of Palestinians is a human rights issue. It's an issue of injustice, uh, of justice. As U.S. citizens, representatives Omar and Tlaib should be free to visit Israel, a country that calls itself a democracy, to learn for themselves how the United States' annual military and financial aid of $3 billion are spent. They should be free to defend U.S. citizens' rights to financially resist Israeli policies by participating in the peaceful boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, a movement inspired by the effective campaign that dismantled the apartheid system in South Africa a few decades ago. Representative Tlaib should be free to visit her elderly grandmother, her city. Um, for Israel to deny a family visit or to make it conditional is truly inhumane. Traveling, learning, resisting, visiting family, these are freedoms that we think we have as citizens of the United States, freedoms that should be upheld by our democracy and by that of Israel if it were the true democracy it claims to be. In my day-to-day -day life, I have the privilege to work with Arab and other Southwest Asian and North African artists, poets, and filmmakers, making space for their necessary work in a culture that is preoccupied with marginalizing and silencing our community. I'd like to end by reading a poem by the Palestinian-American poet, Lina Khalaf Tufaha. Upon arrival, you will need to state the reason for your visit. Don't say, because I want to walk down old roads and caress stone walls the color of my skin. You will need to state the reason for your visit. Don't say, because olives are ready for harvest, and I will coax the fruit from the trees, press it into liquid gold. You will need to state the reason for your visit. Don't say because my parents' house still sits empty on a bluff overlooking the sea. The green shutters my grandfather had just painted remain sealed shut, and the army listed the property's owners as absentees. You will need to state the reason for your visit. Don't say because I am carrying prayers in my suitcase for a people who wait, and I'll unfold them, embroidered linens of verse, and spread them out across the land. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. I did uh, get um, a book of poems from Lena yeah. uh, just recently in uh, Seattle. We were both visiting. And I remember reading on the plane ride back home and crying, and everyone sort of staring at me um, like a crazy person. Um, next, we will hear from Ember Harris, a Minnesota resident who's married to a Palestinian and was denied entry herself. For, uh, we, she will talk about the impact of the travel restrictions. Ember? Thank you. 
Uh, hello, thank you for having me and letting me tell my story. Uh, my name is Amber Harris. I am a Jewish U.S. citizen, and I'm married to a Palestinian uh, from the West Bank with an American Palestinian son. Uh, my story has multiple beginnings, but I'm going to start where the real struggle really began. Um, after my husband and I got engaged in 2015, we were forced to go back to Palestine um, because he had a J-1 visa and it had ended. Um, Everything was fine on my first time I went in because I was a Jewish American, and so it was easy just to go in and visit Israel. Uh, during my three-month stay in the West Bank, my husband and I got legally married, and the Palestinian Authority informed us that for Israel to give me my spousal visa, visa uh, we had to leave and come back. So we got married and left for a honeymoon for about two weeks. And upon our return, I was held interrogated for 10 hours mm -hmm. by the Shin Bet, the Israeli security agency. My marriage documents were almost thrown away, and I was humiliated. <laughs> um, sorry. During my interrogation, uh, they found my Twitter social media and forced me to open my Facebook. They yelled at me for being a human rights activist and environmentalist, um, but was not told why I'm being held, but it was obvious. Um, after dismissal, I was told I was a threat to the state of Israel and the force to sign documents in Hebrew saying I was banned for 10 years. Um, because my husband was not allowed to come with me back to the U.S. because of visa stuff, uh, he couldn't get a visa, I was forced to say immediately goodbye to him, turn around at the border, and go back to the U.S., not knowing when I'd see him again. But because I am privileged, um, I have access, um, and we are able to get a Jewish-Israeli lawyer. It took about four months to help us get a solution to this. Um, and basically, they came back and said that I can attempt to come back by they would want to reinterrogate me, confiscate and search all of my belongings, my electronics, open my social media, and ask for a security deposit. They might ask for a security deposit averaging 10000 to 22000 USD, which they would give back if I left. Um, we were forced to borrow money from my family, which is a privilege within itself. Uh, and I returned again and was held in the Albany Bridge for six hours and eventually was spoke again to a Shimbei officer. Uh, he taunted me, trying to figure out, asking me why I was banned. And I didn't know because we I wasn't told. My lawyer was never told. Um, he eventually said it was because I participated in violent riots and protests. Uh, I was confused and trying to figure out what, where he was coming from, but he shushed me and told me that I'm going to be allowed into the West Bank this time, but I'm under surveillance, and I believe them. Uh, so I was... I was allowed, but I was only allowed, I was not allowed into Israeli proper. I was only allowed into West Bank. So it was West Bank only visa. And the only conclusion I can come up with all of this is that they were punishing me for my activities in the protests of Ferguson, Missouri. Um, I was punished for the freedom of speech in my own country. Uh, and since then, I have faced hurdles and restrictions in entering the West Bank and getting my visa. And I want to make this clear that my story is not unique. Representative Rep. Omar, Rep. Tlaib, Lana's story, and so many are, were not unique. Uh, mine ends in a positive note because of my privilege as a Jewish white American. Uh, but, there's, but these restrictions touch everyone. I know hundreds of stories of other women who are people of color, Muslim, especially Palestinian, who may never be allowed to return solely for the identities that they hold. Israel is denying U.S. citizens for their race, religious beliefs, ethnicity, and ultimately for their political activity within the U.S. The time is now for us all to stand up as Americans to our four fellow citizens being denied basic human international rights based on freedoms that exist within our country. Um, I want to thank... Rep. Omar and Tlaib for giving us this opportunity for speaking out and being strong because it's people like them and actions like these that make a future that my Palestinian son can return and will always have a home to return to. Uh, and thank you for letting me tell my story. Thank you. Thank you, Emperor. And now um, let me introduce current. Corinne Moth, the executive director of the Jewish Community Action. Okay. 
Thank you. My name is Karen Moratz, and I'm the Executive Director of Jewish Community Action. We organize Jews statewide here in Minnesota for racial and economic justice. As Jews around the country in places like Michigan and New York and South Carolina are organizing alongside other communities for immigrant rights, for criminal justice reform, for access to health care and affordable housing, right here as Americans, we recognize that our identities have been weaponized to other us, to divide us from our likeliest allies, and to weaken our collective movements for justice. We recognize and resist the way that our community's values and diversity have been flattened and erased by a president and administration who seek only to use us as pawns in attacks against his political opponents. Our community has been used as a tool by those pretending to be concerned with our safety to undermine the solidarity that we know is needed in order to achieve justice. And we recognize and resist the way that the same has been done to our Muslim neighbors, and we stand with them and against the Islamophobia and racism that's being wielded against them. Our oppression and our resistance are both intertwined. We have been pitted against each other, our communities target, targeted, and our identities weaponized by those who have never stood with us. We have been dehumanized in service of a white nationalist agenda, and our greatest power in resisting that is in our solidarity. The President and this administration have engaged in a calculated campaign to label us all as something other than Americans, tribal above all else, to define our identities for us and to pigeonhole us, to tell us what issues we care about and to tell us who our enemies are. While defending the actions of neo-Nazis, while running ads and raising money with anti-Semitic language, while lifting up the leadership of members of Congress who actively target us, they want to co-opt our freedom, define our oppression, and then use it to turn us against each other. But we will not turn away from one another. We will stand together, not just for our own safety and survival, but in pursuit of justice and peace everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and lastly, we will hear from Rosa DeRucker from the If Not Now movement. Rosa. Thank you so much. My name is Rosa Drucker. I am here as a constituent of Congresswoman Omar, and I'm here as a young Jew. My Jewish values call me to defend the freedom and dignity of all people. It is because of these values that I organize with If Not Now, a movement of American Jews working to end our community's support for the Israeli military occupation over millions of Palestinians. The situation may be complex, but it is not complicated. The occupation is a daily nightmare for those who live it and a moral disaster for those who support it. What we saw this past week demonstrates Israel's desperation to hide the realities of the occupation from us. Palestinians are denied access to medical care, education, economic opportunity, and freedom of movement. The Israeli government receives billions of dollars from the U.S. annually to enforce this cruel regime. When the Israeli government denies entry to our democratically elected members of Congress, they show us that they have something to hide. When American politicians try to silence Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, they are complicit in supporting the occupation. When political leaders peddle hate and sow mistrust, it impacts us right here in Minnesota, where we have seen an increase in hate crimes. When the political right tells Jews to fear progressive leaders, like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, they are weaponizing anti-Semitism for their own gain. I refuse to let my Jewish identity be used as a tool to incite Islamophobia. I reject the narrative that anti-occupation means anti-Jew. All of us should demand human rights for Palestinians. I stand by my Congresswoman in demanding accountability from the Israeli government. I stand by her in the face of racist Islamophobic attacks by those who seek to pit my Jewish community against Muslims. That strategy will not work. We know that the real threat to our communities is white nationalism. The same ideology that motivates anti-Semitism motivates Islamophobia. It is only by standing together against these attacks that we can build a better world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Rosa. And thank you all um, for being here in solidarity um, with us. Uh, I think before we open up um, for questions, I just wanted to say 
what often gets lost in, in this conversation um, is, is the fact that our work in uplifting all marginalized voices is historically documented. Um, and, you know, there isn't really anyone here that we have not done work with. Um, and Rashida talks about the beautiful Detroit community that she represents. The beautiful blackest. Beautiful blackest. City but, I, but I also <laughs> represent Minneapolis, the heart of every progressive movement. <laughs> and we, we did start the labor rights. <laughs> I just want you to know. Um, we, uh, we died for the labor rights movement. Right. That's right, I'm just saying. Um, and, so, and so it is just such an honor to be not serving with you only because we are the first two Muslim women to serve, but because we also represent people who understand and value the, this particular fight we are That's waging right. um, on behalf of all of oppressed people around the world. So we'll take a few questions. We have to get to a town hall in a little bit. So. Representative Omar, what's the reaction from your district? You, feel like you do represent a number of synagogues, too. The reaction um, in, in my district has been um, a, an overwhelming outcry uh, and condemnation of the particular action that's been taken uh, by the Netanyahu administration um, and the urging of uh, our president. I mean, people really are uh, appalled in many ways. Uh, people feel like when you are a United States citizen, forget the fact that we are members of Congress. When you are the United, uh, United States citizen, uh, that your president, your ambassadors, your State Department works on your behalf. They defend you um, and fight for your right uh, to, to, to freedom of speech, to freedom of movement, um, and, uh, and to have an administration um, and a president, uh, and an ambassador. Unfortunately, we've had an interruption in our schedule. We will get back to our normal programming just as soon as possible. The Senate Commerce Subcommittee on Technology held a hearing on illegal robocalls 